Alejandro with me, Robert, and also Marco and Richard. So, hey guys. Today, we've got a couple of issues, but the, the main thing we're going to be discussing is George Galloway. So, on the show recently, we've been discussing various pro Palestine, pro Gaza, whatever advocates, and we've been really kind of looking at how a lot of what they're speaking about is either aimed at kind of erasing the crimes that have been against Israel, or they're actually driven by anti-Semitism in many cases. And we're focusing on George Galloway today. For those who don't know who George Galloway is, uh, I envy your blissful ignorance, but George Galloway is a socialist who's um, been active in UK politics for many decades now, uh, was a member of the British Parliament until 2015, and since then has kind of been hosting a talk show. And he represents a really radical kind of left-wing socialistic perspective, which is very pro kind of any Arab kind of political cause that you can get. Um, so Marco and Richard, I'll come to you guys first. So one, what do you think about George Galloway and what do you think about his views about Israel-Palestine, anti-Semitism, all this kind of stuff? <clears throat> okay, well, um, firstly, I want to say that I kind of resent having to talk about him at all, to be perfectly honest. I resent the fact that his name has to leave my, my lips particularly when I in a medium where I can't then swear like a docker afterwards, but we will see whether that resolve holds or not. Um, I resent giving him the pro undue prominence, which, which he, he really doesn't merit, because he is a historic, uh, I would say a, a marginal, his, in terms of uh, b being a former MP, historical political figure. Um, and most of all, I kind of resent uh, the fact that, that there's a danger of giving a misleading impression that he in any way represents UK politics or any wider view uh, to any outside audience, uh, particularly outside of the UK. But I do understand that it's necessary to talk about these uh, despicable characters from time to time, but we must put them in their context if we're going to do so. Um, uh, because otherwise I'd be tempted to get up and walk out, just as Gaw uh, George Galloway himself did um, in, in an interview, uh, I, th I think it was the Oxford Union, wasn't it, when he was talking to somebody who he discovered was an Israeli, uh, and uh, that was enough for him to up and leave the stage. Um, so that gives you an indication of what he's like. He is uh, an attention-seeking, parasitic, uh, useful idiot for a certain group of uh, Arab Muslim uh, voters who, uh, particularly in the 2010s or uh, the earlier than that even, when he first came on the stage, moving from Labour to set, to join a, another party called Respect, and Respect, you can tell by the, the term Respect, that, uh, that is, is not, uh, it's not how any of us would use the term Respect, let's put it that way. Uh, we can perhaps get into the detail of that. But he was a useful idiot for both sides. He provided um, the, the, those with a, a prejudices towards Israelis, the Arab group, the, the Arab voters that were prejudiced towards Israelis, with a, a white face from the uh, established Labour Party who could represent them. And at the same time, he could use them in order to hop from constituency to constituency, which he did like a couple of times, um, to, to harvest the votes of that uh, particular block in order to have power and then wield influence and then subsequently being uh, having left parliament using it as a platform for um for talk shows etc I'm, I'm not sure i totally agree on on, on the fact that he's not representing a political view because he is is part of the corbyn old reject from the 70s who still believe in socialism and this kind of weird stuff uh which now goes away um, and 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 as such, you represent, as Richard said, the the the, the kind of Muslim side of of, of the argument in, of the left. Um, the, the guy, uh, yeah, is 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 politically is a intellectual pygmy, really. I mean, it's it's not really uh, it, that doesn't really wield any weight anywhere yet. Probably never did really. Um, but uh, the guy is is not. He's not an intellectual, but he's not totally dumb either, because he knows, for example, that um, not, not to deny the Holocaust and not to deny certain things about, about the, um, the, the Jewish population. Um, however, every time you hear him talk about Israel, he, do, he doesn't accept the existence of the state of Israel in the first place. 
um, but you should recourse it with with, uh, with, with, with talk, talking about Zionism rather than anti-Semitism. Now, to me, it's just a, a front. Um, it, it's really just being um, anti-Semitic by the back door, but making it sound like, oh no, I'm perfectly fine with it. Um, not not me, Gav. You know, I'm, I'm totally legit. And to be honest, yeah, uh, th- th- there's not much into him to be honest. But Alejandro, I'll come to you. Next. So what you know, Marco is getting at is something that's brought up very often. I think is the kind of broader subject we can always kind of draw from George Galloway because this is something he talks about a lot. Is that we can draw a distinction between being uh, anti-Semitic and being anti-Israel. And I sent you guys some you know clips and stuff of George Galloway. I don't know if you had a look at them. Something that he often moves between is talking about the Jewish community, which he's taking an objection to, and then the and and then talking about Israel. And this is a kind of quandary which I think gets to people very often is, um, you know, is it anti-Semitic to be anti-Israel? And this kind of, and people end up being very confused about this and so on. So, so one, what do you think about George Galloway? But then also, what do you think about this issue of um, struggling to parse out Israel, being anti-Semitic and being anti-Israel? Uh, certainly. I think that's one of the core questions in, in the sense that I think that one can be opposed to Israel or Zionism or or even be skeptical of what Israel means. And I, I'm not completely sure that one that entails that one uh, is anti-Semitic as such. Uh, the motive, motives can be different and there can be people who are genuinely confused by the topic and be opposed to, to, to the state of Israel and not hate Jews as such. Um, now, I think I I I'm one of the persons who wasn't aware of who George Galloway was, and I searched for him if he had denied any of the charges of anti-Semitism, and apparently I, I couldn't find anything. I, the, the, there was a video where he was more or less um, being interviewed or being heavily questioned about that, and he he said that. Um, the Holocaust had been a, a terrible thing. Uh, so in that sense, I, I I I would like to say that he more or less denies that he's an anti-Semite. anti-Semite. That's what my what my impression would be. Now, that's one of, that's a statement of a person, and then one should judge his actions and his statements and the way that he reacts to things. And whatever he does uh, related to issues uh, dealing with Israel to see if he is really an anti-Semit or not. Um, so, uh, for instance, uh, talking about another topic, since we're the Enron Center UK, uh, for instance, Ayn Rand talked about uh, the, the left in the 1950s and 60s, saying that it was a massive uh, failure. And instead of going to capitalism in the name of humanity, they said, "Oh, let's redouble the, uh, let's double down on the on, on the leftism, and let's take away the human progress part, uh, so that we can continue continue with the leftism." So that means, and that suggests to you that their their goal isn't human progress or human flourishing, but rather destroying it. And the way that I see George Galloway, and again, uh, this is from what I see from the outset and without studying him a lot is that he really doesn't um, approve or anything that Israel does. He's one of the deniers that there was such a thing as uh, a killer, a, a, a killing on uh, October 7th. And, uh, and he actually blames the idea for that. Now, just quoting those conspiracies, uh, conspiracy fantasies on the outset, and, and 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 instead of going for a full scrutiny, would suggest to you that his motives isn't just trying to seek the truth and uh, looking for something, and therefore would suggest to you that his motives are, are rather less um, genuine and honest. Mm. Yeah. So, and then Robert, I'll come to you. So, Alejandro's right very much so that he. If you ask him if he's an anti-Semite, he will really deny it. Um, and so what we get is a, you know, an avowed denial that, of anti-Semitism, a condemnation of it, and so on. And yet what you get in George Galloway's actions, as 
Alejandro was saying is I think something that indicates something different and so what do you think one what do you make of the man himself from what you've seen but then also what do you think about this issue of being anti-Israel not anti-Semitic not anti-Semitic and so on and so forth sorry you were asking me I think he probably saved me for last because you know I've got a lot to say you know even the BDS movement has condemned Galloway you know his refusal to interact with Israelis walking out on this debate because even though he's it's already started and, and the event has already begun he finds out this guy's Israeli George Galloway his statement that he is not an anti Semite but he is anti-Zionist uh, I think Alejandro is right you need to address that on its merits it's very easy to dismiss it and say well you're you're not anti-Semitic except for the 7.1 million Jewish people in Israel. We can point out those contradictions, but I, th I think you're right. We need to be able to say, maybe he means it, in which case it's even worse. But take him at his word. Take him seriously. We don't want to be simplistic about this. Galloway is is a horrible person in every conceivable way. We don't need to make up additional ways in which he's horrible. His you know, meetings with Saddam Hussein, his concern during the Iraqi war, not with the liberated Iraqis who were saved from Saddam Hussein. You know, when he went to see Saddam Hussein, he said, sir, I salute your courage, your strength, your indefatigability. Galloway is, is horrible in every way you would imagine a man to be horrible. But we can take him at his word. The one thing about Galloway is I do believe that he's earnest, that he really believes what he says he believes. And again, that doesn't make him better. It makes him worse. You could argue it makes him more honest, but it makes him more irrational, which makes him even more dishonest. His recent tweet, for anybody who doesn't know, George Galloway is an active politician in the UK and the States. We're like, eh, I've heard the guy's name. He's always saying stupid things. His recent post on Twitter, let me just read this real quick. The foul allegations of rape have been dropped by the Israeli government. The 40 beheaded babies has been downscaled to one dead baby, not beheaded, and killed by persons unknown. Two thirds of the Israelis killed on October 7th uh, were military personnel. The killers of the remaining one third are definitively revealed to have been in part the Israeli armed forces themselves. I won't read the whole thing, it goes on. Uh, he argues that any well, anybody who has any cachet, uh, public intellectuals, those with influence, he says, who spread the propaganda to the contrary of all of this, stand exposed as war criminals. And now much blood stains their character forever. Well, that's us. Whatever impact you think we are having with the Ayn Rand Center UK, we have a global reach. We do have an impact. And that makes me a war criminal in George Galloway's eyes. I'm not just going to take that as an empty insult. I'm going to take him at his word. I'm going to assume that he means it. And I'm not just going to answer him in anger. I'm going to answer him in logic. Because I think we need to take this stuff seriously. George Galloway is, is a, you know, bring out all the insults and the four-letter words, and he deserves every one of them. And yet at the same time, he has enough influence with people who, for whom his words resonate that, yeah, we've got to take him seriously. Um, I could go on, but let me pass the microphone for a moment uh, and say, yeah, yeah, Galloway, horrible in every way, but does need to be taken seriously so long as he is an active politician, as well as a TV host. And uh, yeah, that killer combination we get so much these days, if we talk about Malay, we'll talk about the better side of that. Yeah. Um... So I guess there's a lot of things. Um, I think it was Marco who mentioned that he represents a kind of um, Jeremy Corbyn-like um, strand of British politics. And what's interesting, if you go onto YouTube and you have a look at some of Galloway's speeches in the House of Commons, he's often sat next to Jeremy Corbyn, which is a very interesting kind of thing, because a lot of Galloway's problems are the same re regarding anti-Semitism and the problems that Corbyn has. Um, so, and, he's, and Galloway's often a very... Um, vocal defender of Jeremy Corbyn. Um, I saw that tweet as well, Robert. I thought that was very interesting. Um, the way he phrases the tweet, it's as if 
the Israeli government had made the claim about 40 beheaded babies. But actually, so far as I can tell, actually, the Israeli government never did that. That The source of that quote is actually from Joe Biden, who seems to have been acting on some faulty intelligence. And then after Biden said that, it was reported widely in the media. Um, however, what was interesting when I was looking into it was that even Al Jazeera, which is hardly a kind of pro-Israel uh, news source, it's very much um, biased towards the other side, right? Um, were saying that the Israeli government had never made any such claim. So there's something off about his tweet even there. And what that tweet reminds me of very much was what we were talking about on the show the other day of people like Owen Jones and Navarro Media, who are looking to kind of undermine the claims of what's been going on in Israel and of what went on in Israel in, on October 7th. Um, and so I think that tweet's very much representative of that. Um, then just for the audience, <clears throat> we made reference a couple of times to this debate. So Galloway had been invited to a debate at Oxford um, I'm not sure if it was the Oxford Union, but it was some kind of debating society at Oxford University. And there's a video of it on YouTube, which anyone can go find, of the guy uh, who's opposing him standing at the podium. And he makes reference to, we should not make this mistake again. And the we in that sense is referring to Israel. And Galloway stops the debate, asks the guy, sorry, are you Israeli? To which the guy says, yes, yes, I am. And then he instantly grabs his coat, walks out, says, I've been deceived or misled and refuses to go in there. And this was quite controversial in the UK at the time. I think this was around 2012. Um, and that's <clears throat> part of when the allegations against uh, George Galloway of anti-Semitism kind of came into the news. And it's kind of come up every few years since. He had a very public falling out with uh, Alan Sugar on the news um, about Tottenham Hotspurs. Alan Sugar used to own Tottenham Hotspurs and Tottenham Hotspurs is a football club which has a huge Jewish following. And Galloway was celebrating the fact that Hotspurs had lost some game. And in celebrating it, he tweeted out saying, thankfully, we're not going to see any Israeli flags flown on the, um, on the cup, the Premier League Cup this year. Right? So he's got a long history of this kind of thing. Um, oh, and then as well, uh, Robert, you mentioned him going to uh, visit Saddam Hussein. So Galloway has a lot positive to say about the Ba'athist party, which was Hussein's uh, political party in Iraq. Um, and as I understand it, he actually visited Tehran and proceeded through the streets in a tank in a really strange fashion. Um, and so, yeah, so I think Galloway is a really despicable figure. But I want to nail down this issue a little bit more of being anti-Israel and being anti-Jewish, because one of the other things that, like I said, that Galloway often does is he complains about Israel declares himself to be anti-Israel, anti-Zionist, and yet often will make a complaint about the Jewish community. And I think very often, because so whilst it's literally the case that I think you can be anti-Israel and not be anti-Semitic, or you, and you could oppose something the Israeli government's done, or you could not believe in Zionism, I think that that's used as a smokescreen by people who kind of are anti-Semitic and understand that that's bad PR. And I think that that, so therefore his protestations are basically a smokescreen meant to kind of confuse people or get them away from the fact that he actually does have a problem with the Jews. Um, Mark and Richard, do you guys agree with me on that? Or do you think there's something else going on? I do agree with you on that. I think, um, I think we ought to stress how, le how left wing he is and how, how far to the left. And a couple of examples that really bear that out are the kind of uh, broadcasters that he's worked for up, up until recently. Uh, which we haven't mentioned so far, including he working for an Iranian TV channel, I believe, for a while, and certainly for Russia Today, where he had a, a programme on it, a regular programme on it, called Sputnik, um, where and Russia Today being the absolute propaganda channel for the Russian government, which uh, really shouldn't have been on air in the UK at all, and where I believe was taken off the, off the air around the time of uh, uh, a couple of years ago, possibly at the start of the uh, the war with Ukraine, I can't remember the exact timing of that. But um, but he was cer certainly, and he was one of the, those uh, the most highly paid uh, British presenter on Russia Today because he 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 served the uh, the, the agenda of the Russians in promoting uh, dissent in the UK and uh, and advocating for the kind of tribalism that he was he was uh, al always behind. Um, I think I think there's always been um, if, you, if you listen to him, him talk, he's very forceful in, in his words, uh, very uh, sort of I don't know what the word is, rambunctious, boisterous. He, he's the sort of um, speaker that wants to 
semi scrap with the audience at the same time as making making points and and, and certainly to, uh, to to shout people down where necessary uh, to, to get his point across uh, and in the course of the very slow manner in which he talks and the way in which he talks he'll correct himself sometimes when he strays for confusing those two issues for confusing uh, anti Semitism uh, with uh, um, anti Israel anti Zionism all of those categories so he'll self correct or he'll correct when prompted to by a uh, by an interviewer who's on the ball and who brings that to light, but it doesn't. Uh, it only serves to expose the fact that in, in in his mind it clearly they're all muddled together and essentially it's all the same all the same bag for him yeah i mean going back to criticize israel of course it, it is possible to criticize israel without being anti-semitic and of course you can also say well i don't think it should be a one-state solution it should be a two three five fifteen state solution um the, the point here is the context when galloway uh, anti-Semitism or, or anti-Zionism, whatever anti is using, um, always transpires the fact that um, it is, is against Jewish people in, in the same territory as we now call Israel. That, that's the bottom line, which means, OK, after 75 years, what do we do? Shall we chuck those people in the sea? Uh, what about all the infrastructure they built? Because you know, in 75 years, Israel built Tel Aviv. And, and Gaza built tunnels, stuffed with, with, with weapons, um, in order to attack another country. So how are you going to address this? It, it's, it's just it's just a big. If you look at the context, it's just a big excuse to um, masquerade, as I said before, um, anti anti um, Jewish sentiment. Um, you know, with with, uh, with with pure 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 evil, and. Uh, the, the constant equivalence he makes between the um, Islamophobia and the anti-Semitism, it's, it's, it, 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 it tries to be clever, but it's, it's easy to, to, to read between the line. So then I'll come back to you, Alejandro. Um, I'm sorry for having to introduce you to George Galloway if you were, again, blissfully ignorant of his existence. Um, and I, I, I agree with you that we have to judge him by his actions and, and not his statements. I think that's really right. Um, but to what, so to what, how common do you think it is to be actually anti Semitic and, and to just claim that you're anti Israel or anti Zionist? Like, to what extent do you think this is a kind of widespread um, problem? When people say, I'm anti Israel, what to the extent do you think it's actually very often just an expression of anti Semitism? Um, I don't know. I, I think um, maybe just to reemphasize my my comment, if for instance you, I think uh, Alex Epstein makes a really good point um, that if for instance you don't want you if you would say uh, well I don't hate polar bears but I want to reduce polar bear impact to the minimum possible, then you are in reality against polar bears because a better world uh, would be one where there would be no polar bears right because you'd reduce their impact to zero i think in that context um if you if your actions and your standard of values and the way that you judge things is oh if israel wouldn't be here or Jews wouldn't be here the world would be better or in other sense uh if, if Anything that uh, Jews uh, do is is bad, but and you use another standard or another way to measure than any other um, thing that has happened in the world. Let's say that uh, something happened in Israel, something Israel did something, and you are blaming them and you're uh, shaming them. You're saying something's really evil that they 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 did, but you don't do the same with any other country in the world then you start being really suspicious about that. Now, I think that with Israel, there's some phenomenon regarding that. And I'm going to speak mainly from an anecdotal um, reference. I, I'm not sure, I, I'm, I'm not serving anyone or saying that this is a common case. 
but certainly the people that speak to me negatively about Israel um, without obviously not knowing my position, so they, they are a bit more open about that, is usually themselves being really critical with whatever they do, accepting everything that is being said against Israel without any critical face, and then disregarding anything that would make Israel better or look better in reality. And in that sense, I would say that there is some anti-Semitism regarding that. How prevalent is that within the pool of people that I heard talking about or against Israel? I would say it's pretty large, but it's I, I would I wouldn't say it's the the main or the majority of them. Well, well sorry, it's not the hundred percent of them, but certainly it's a large majority. I think that Alex Epstein point is really good. I hadn't heard that Alex has said that, but that was that's an interesting way of putting it. And so, Robert, I guess another way of putting of Galloway putting across that he's not anti-Semitic, but he's pro-Israel. Oh, sorry, that he's anti he's anti-Israel. Uh, is he says that he's in favor of a one state solution. He's not in favor of a two state solution, but he thinks that that one state should be Palestine. Um, do you think there's something anti-Semitic about that? Because of course, if Palestine, if the one country in the region were to be Palestine, almost certainly Jews would not be able to exist in Palestine. For, in Gaza, for example, there are no Jews in Gaza right now. Um, so do you think if you're in favor of a one state solution, where it's just Palestine in the region. Do you think that is kind of de facto anti-Semitism? De facto, yes. But I don't think we do anything to bolster our arguments or even to defeat George Galloway by focusing only on that. I believe we can only counter Galloway's arguments if we take them seriously, if we're not simplistic, if we don't say, well, it boils down to this and then ignore everything else that he says. Now, you may be right about Galloway. I think he is, you know, the lowest order. He's a piece of, we use feces for fertilizer, so that still has value. He's a piece of used gum on the bottom of his shoe. He's the worst kind of human being. I'm not defending George Galloway when I say we need to take his statements in earnest and not overanalyze them to the point where we're being simplistic. Oh, good, we've distilled him down to, he is anti-Semitic, so now we, no, we don't want to do that. And I'll tell you why. Even if he harbors anti-Semitism, even if in between all of his charming Scottish accented words, there's an actual anti-Semite in there, we're not addressing Galloway directly. We are addressing Galloway's other supporters. We're addressing his listeners. At a debate with George Galloway, we're not trying to beat George Galloway. We're trying to beat George Galloway's arguments. So that's why I say maybe he's not earnest. Maybe there really is a seething anti-Semite underneath all that. It's kind of hard to imagine there's not. If he doesn't support Israel in today's context, just because of the claim that it's not a proper state and it needs to be returned to where it was. We, we need to defend the ideas. And that's why we need to be able to say, even if George Galloway is earnestly not anti-Semitic, his claims to having friends that are Jews, he respects people who are Jews, he loves Jews around the world, he just thinks that the state of Israel is improper, and the disasters for Gaza and West Bank it's led to have been horrors. He's still wrong, even on his merits. Now, I understand the risk of accepting your opponent's premises. This is not that. This is simply taking him at his word, and then we need to be able to disassemble his argument. I'm always going to make that point. We can sit here and say, and with good reason, oh, well, we know what he really means. That's useless. That's pointless, even if we're right, because we need to be able to address his merits. I don't give a crap about George Galloway, but I do care about people who say, yeah, I don't have any problem with Jewish people, but yeah, given the history of the Middle East, yeah, we need to get Israel out of there. There are people saying that. There are Whether it's Galloway really meaning it or not, and that's why I say, sure, it's okay to say, I'd study George Galloway. He is just a seething ball of hatred, including hatred for Jews. 
I don't believe anything he said. It's okay to do that. But the important part of the argument is to address the merits. And that's why I, I will always go back to the simple facts and not trying to characterize what George Galloway really means. If he really thinks that given this point in history, there is somehow a way to turn the clock back to when Israel was established, turn the clock back to the 1940s and say, you know, Britain did the wrong thing. They should have chosen a different homeland for Israel. It wouldn't have satisfied the folks in Israel. I understand that because that particular real estate, its location in in, in Judea, the Jerusalem, all of that would have made it more difficult. But point is, we could turn back the clock and change it, even if you think that. It's ahistorical in 2023 to say, and therefore, let's throw 7.145 million Jews out of Israel. Is George Galloway an anti-Semite? I said it before, I'll say it again. Yes, if you take into account that he wants to take 7 million people and throw them out of their country, and all those 7 million people have in common is they are Israelis. His behavior at that debate made that clear, as I mentioned at the very beginning. I just don't want us to oversimplify this issue. It's all too easy to want to get to the end of a show like this and say, hey, we've thrown out all those irrelevant details and gotten down to what really matters. When some of those irrelevant details aren't irrelevant, there are people out there with Galloway's perspective. There are if not anti-Zionists, at least people who don't understand the need for an Israeli state, who are also not anti-Semites. Galloway's horrible. That particular perspective, not without all of Galloway's baggage, may or may not be horrible, but it's something we need to be able to discuss. For sure. Um, okay, I think we've probably done that topic. So let's go to the next one. So. If you don't mind, um, so did you want to? I, I just wanted to mention that in terms of characters like Galloway, who are like the early opportunists at the fringes of uh, a political spectrum, I think one of the ways that we need to look at them is what is their legacy and the effect on the the mainstream of uh, of, of of the spectrum subsequent to them appearing on the scene particularly when somebody like him emerges out of a party, in this case, the Labour Party, and how the Labour Party changes subsequently to him sp um, spinning off, for, uh, becoming the only MP for this new party. And then, because uh, at the moment, the, the Labour Party, as you've discussed on other shows, does have a split within it. And it does have a proportion of Galloway-esque uh, group uh, that uh, that are trying to depart from the leader of the Labour Party, Keir Starmer, in his uh, consistent so far message that uh, in, you know backing uh, the the Israelis in their self defence, whereas a great chunk of his uh, MPs or a certain uh, a significant group of his MPs and a number of resignations that have followed within the lower ranks of, in local government have gone effectively the Galloway the Galloway route. Um, because because that's definitely what one of the key effects that that I think he's had and uh, bearing in mind on one other fact I wanted to mention which which relates to uh, when he was an MP for the respect party which was in this very area of London that we that we often talk about which is uh, the where newer meets Tower Hamlets the area that we've spoken about we recently where an MP left the Labour Party and stood as an independent candidate and was instantly re-elected. That's the same area we're talking about. It's like having a focus on Dearborn or Hamtrak um, sort of every time. Uh, so he's it's the same same area that he's he was representing. And on the on the leaflets of that particular party, what when it, when they went out electioneering, the whole of Israel was described on their leaflets as occupied territories. Um, so it, that, 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 you know, not just Gaza or the West Bank, but the whole of the country, you know, it, it's an equivalent of a for the river to the sea statement on paper. Um, and, and he and he was the only ever elected MP for that party, which has since been disbanded. Uh, those are the facts I just wanted to, to, to add into it. 
so, something else I want to point out that these guys, the, the, the reason why I mention is the same kind of brand as uh, Corbyn is because these guys are staunchly anti-capitalist. They want to overthrow the whole system. They want to they want to go back to the old USSR. They want trade union involvement in every single aspect of life. They want socialism. In fact, if they could push as far as communism, that would be you know the happiest people on the planet. Um, and, and I think most of the time they actually exploit this particular issue because, well, first of all, Israel is, is, is clearly is the only capitalist and the only f freedom loving um, outfit out there in the Middle East. So they, they hate it by default. They couldn't possibly let it get away. Talk about hate of the good for being the good. Um, and, and I think that they're also exploiting the Muslim vote here in Britain. Um, in order to uh, foment anti-capitalist sentiment across their ranks. And, and that's very easy because, let's face it, these, these Muslim guys are very much tribal. They don't care what the message behind is as long as you wave the flag and say Allah by the end of it. Mm. Very good. So, I mean, I don't want to cut you guys off then if there's more to say. Alejandro, Robert, anything else to say about George Galloway or any of this? No. no? Oh, okay, cool. So our second topic for today is about Javier Millet. Um, and given that we've been speaking about um, the war in Israel and anti-Semitism related topics, we actually haven't really covered the fact that he's actually won the election in Argentina in this kind of unexpected fashion. Um, and the reason why he was in the news is because he appointed an attorney general who had been um, some kind of Nazi when he was younger. I'm forgetting exactly what it was, uh, but it was some kind of Nazi youth organization he'd been a member of. And he'd actually been a member of um, the government, I think back in the 90s, and had been forced to resign when it had been revealed that he'd been a member of this organization. Um, and I think this is <laughs> unfortunate for Millet, basically, because this is a PR nightmare. If it, it seems to have been fairly well known that this guy had been a part of this organization. And for him to appoint someone with this kind of past, no matter how maybe legitimately he may have changed his mind now uh, to a government position, given the war going on. This is just like a, an incredibly foolish decision on the one hand, um, but also perhaps some representing something kind of unsavory on the other. One of the things that I think you end up seeing about a lot of this stuff is that people kind of almost don't count anti-Semitism as a very, as like the a, a top ranking racism in a way. It's kind of something that's not so bad or something like that, which you can get around. Um, but I want to hear what you guys think about this. So one, what do you think about Malay's victory on the one hand, since we haven't had a chance to really discuss that, but um, and what do you make of him himself? But then also, what do you think about this decision to appoint this attorney general? Um, do you think if this guy's legitimately changed his mind, it should be bygones be bygones or, or what do you think? And Alejandro, I'll, I'll come to you first. Well, first of all, I think that... I... You mentioned the victory. I'm very really worried about the victory, especially uh, remembering the the fiasco of Liz Truss. I think he's better than Liz Truss, but certainly I think his challenges probably are even worse than the one that she had, given that the people don't uh, have even uh, knowledge what the free market is. Um, and I think that he's, in, in a sense, he's sometimes he's not a very good defender of the better ideas in his rhetoric as well uh and and related to to this uh selection of his cabinet he's been pandering and basically giving up everything to what you would call the center right the macri uh band which is was basically a disaster when they they were in power and basically his whole cabinet now is going to be led by ex macrist uh, leading by, for instance, uh, Caputo, which is going to be his main um, arm, I think, in the economy ministry or something like uh, related to that, uh, instead of uh, Ocampo, which was the, the one of the guys who wanted to lead the dollarization. So my impression is that he's not going to be able to to do much um he i think he's counting on being more or less successful in the first uh year and then trying to set a wave of reforms in the second and third year i'm very skeptical that he will be able to to do so um so 
it, that's related to his presidency and I'm, I'm i'm really worried about that now this guy uh, rodolfo barra as you mentioned he he was a member of the supreme court in argentina during the menem years menem was a peronist guy in the 1990s a peronist president but he after a massive hyperinflation in the country, he basically decided to liberalize a good chunk of the economy. And during the 1990s, Argentina looked that he, it was going to at last become uh, a good country. Uh, sadly, uh, Argentina is Argentina. And then it happened, the 2000s collapse with the massive crisis and every, every single improvement that had been done was basically reversed. Um, but this guy Barra was basically, uh, as you, as you said, um, mentioned that he was going to become a person. Uh, he, he was basically uh, said said that he wa had had been part of one of the uh, fascist um, uh, groups in, in the country, especially in the '60s when he was younger, and he was allegedly. Uh, responsible of one uh, attempt, uh, terrorist attempt against a synagogue in the 1960s. I'm not sure if he if he um, says or he has denied that, but certainly he he doesn't seem to be really uh, pro um, pro pro Jewish in his in his youth. But then uh, this is my last point. Uh, in in the mid 1990s, I think in 1994. There was a massive um, tourist attack against uh, Jewish people in a, a car bomb, which now has been uh, probably been stated that it was from Iran. But uh, there was also some skepticism against anyone who showed to be uh, anti-Jewish. So when this photo came out and his ties with Nazism came out, he was sacked. He has apologized and he has said that it had been a massive mistake by his part. But now uh, that he's been instituted, I, I think as well as you, I think it looks like a terrible business mistake for Millet. And my impression is that he's trying to impose some of the guys that were with Menem to uh, set, set again some of the agenda of liberalizing the economy that Menem had, but as well, I think that this guy Barra doesn't seem like the best guy to do that. And so, Robert, uh, the same thing, really. What do you think about Malay's victory? And then what do you think about this decision to appoint the Attorney General? Yeah, I'm looking forward to this. I am, I am so excited about what's going to happen in Argentina. You know, we can make a lot of comparisons of Malay. You can compare him to Margaret Thatcher or Ronald Reagan in his rhetoric, in his uh, references to, to, I don't know, maybe not what we would call principles, but his references to capitalist principles and, and rational economics. And, you know, whatever our criticisms were of Reagan and Thatcher and, you know, their conservatism, traditionalism, obviously anti-abortion, et cetera, versus being principled and having independent thought. Most of us recognize Thatcher and Reagan were good for the country compared to almost all of the alternatives that were out there. They did more good than ill. And most of us are glad they held office. Certainly Thatcher more than Reagan. <laughs> there are worse ways you could bring free market economics to South America. You know, those of us who understand the history of uh, Chile, how Pinochet brought the Chicago boys in. And they saved the country even under a dictatorship. Imagine how much better it would have been if the president himself had been pro-capitalist, well, Millet says anarcho-capitalist, he's not very anarcho. He's said, for example, we can't get rid of welfare. Uh, we got to phase it out slowly. There's too many poor people. That's not very anarcho to me. That sounds like he's uh, got a better handle. Millet versus Pinochet was actually elected to office. And okay, personality-wise, you know, he's probably more of a cross between Donald Trump and, and, and Vladimir Zelensky. You know, what he has in common with both of them and even with Reagan is an entertainment background. He's been on television. He knows how to speak to an audience and he doesn't hold back. That's going to serve him really, really well. Now, this faux pas that he made in hiring somebody who's got trouble in their background 
And certainly fascist or Nazi is a bad, bad thing to have in your background at this point in world history, much less any time in world history. But I think precisely because Malay has such a strong personality, he's going to survive this and it's not going to do him too much harm. You know, people redeem themselves. They grow up. They get better. This guy, has. there's some reason for Malay to believe, well, he's, he's not that kind of guy. Not anymore. You know, we've, we've followed the types of people who had, uh, think of um, Richard Hananya, intellectual, Yaron Brook likes to follow. The guy was an out and out racist and hid the fact it came out recently. And he's like, yeah, yeah, when I was younger and stupid, I did that. Uh, or think of somebody on our own channel who had a criminal background and has turned himself around. Uh, the great thing about people like that, you see this with Hananya, you're hopefully seeing this in the Malay administration, is those are the kind of people who will tell you, you know, you're right. You're right. I did the wrong thing. I said the wrong thing. I believe the wrong thing. And you are right to be suspicious and you should make me prove myself. It's the mark of an honest man is he doesn't deny what he did, make excuses. Oh, that's not me anymore. No. And you can tell, well, you can tell that with one of our own co-hosts who says flat out, yeah, I'm not that guy anymore, but I'm also not going to ask you to take me on faith. I think Malay has a strong enough personality that he will drag this guy out of the nonsense that the media is going to put him through and it'll be okay. And if not, he'll change his administration. It's one of the things that you can do is say, uh, yeah, this guy's not going to serve that role. I think it's going to be good. I'm really excited, really excited. Again, not because I think Malay's perfect. He's certainly not an objectivist, even though he says more about Ayn Rand than Ronald Reagan ever did. But because compared to all the alternatives, it's going to be good. And Marco Richard, same thing for you guys. Um, what do you think of Javier Malay? Of, as Robert's mentioning, he's got influence from Ayn Rand there, even if I think that Ayn Rand, as you points out, his understanding isn't maybe as sterling as it could be. So what, what do you think about him in general and his victory? And then what do you think about this scandal with the Attorney General? Yeah, for, for, first, first of all, you mentioned the fact that it was a surprise victory. Well, Alejandro you know, forecast this one month ago. So, you know, credit or credit is due. Um, <laughs> uh, um, yeah, yeah. I mean, the, the guy is not an intellectual; he's a politician. So, you know, there's going to be uh, rims and rims of uh, um, compromise and stuff like that. Yes, he quotes Saint Rand, but it, you know, not, not exactly the way we'd like him to do it. Um, yes, he, he got Elon Musk to, to to post a few videos, a few interesting videos of him. Um, so, you know. Hopefully, there's going to be some sort of uh, spreading of ideas, which are not the, the usual communist good, uh, com um, capitalism bad. Um, let's hope so. You know, I, I second uh, uh, Robert's optimism. Um, not too much, because we, we've seen, uh, it, it, you, you mentioned uh, trust. What was it, Alejandro um, Pass? The, 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 the establishment came out against, against her, um, for example, um, in the case of uh, uh, Liz Truss, where the, the, bond, the, the interest for the bonds, the, 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 the uh, yields went to 4.3%. They've been to 4.8, 4.5 since, and nobody butted an eyelid. So if, if, when somebody decides this guy doesn't have to have any room to move, um, they come out of the woodwork. And But uh, again, as Robert said, this um, Miller is, uh, is used to dealing with the media, so probably is, is fairly thick-skinned. Hopefully, you know, hopefully he's going to do some good stuff, even if he doesn't go, if he doesn't do very good for um, Argentina as a whole. Um, at least he will have pushed out some new views out there. So um, let's hope for the best. And about the Attorney General guy, well, you know, I, I like the fact that if you were um, on, the, on the right side, even if you were an Nazi youth, it's impossible to wipe out, even if you apologize, you recognize you, you made a mistake. While if you were a communist and you were supporting Mao or, or Stalin, that's fine. You know, it's just youth, you know, Bostro's youth. Um, nobody ever expects somebody who supported Stalin to resign because of, of his views. But, you know, that, that's, that comes with the past, doesn't it? My early impression of him is uh, in the plus column, there's certainly the moral defense of capitalism, uh, as opposed to the economic defense of capitalism. Uh, and that is refreshing to hear. And obviously that warms, warms all our souls, uh, especially in such a barren landscape across the world when it comes to politicians doing anything uh, of that kind. 
I think it's very early days to judge. And I, I think actions are what, are what is going to determine all of our opinions of him in the long run. And of course, his own resilience in the face of opposition. And in terms of, for example, if we, Robert mentioned uh, Margaret Thatcher, and it took Margaret Thatcher a good few years from winning in 79 to being able to turn the ship of the country around by like 82, 83, and really pursue the agenda that she wanted to and to undo the absolute mess that the country, the UK was in back in the late 70s. Um, now, and I think part of the reason she was elected then was because the country was in a desperate mess and was desperate to try anything. And Thatcher was a bit of a unknown quantity for the electorate back then, possibly in the same way that Malay is an unknown quantity now, but it isn't going to be a quick turnaround for the ship of Argentina to to um, to correct its course. And in the kind of age that we live in, where people expect results to be far more instant, where people don't allow uh, in the 24 hour news cycle, a few years to pass to show the effects of new policies and, and the undoing of old, old policies to, 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 to have their, 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 their true uh, implementation, then will he be given the time, either by the Argentinian people, by the politicians in his cabinet, by the uh, the wider areas of uh, the you know the civil service or the, or, or government or investors or or, um, or countries abroad, whatever, to actually demonstrate that he, he can stick to the course that he's hinted he's going to, and we hope he will. Mm. My view on Malay, I mean, I guess I've said what I think about the, the anti-Semitism scandal and since I think it's very foolish to have appointed this guy, especially in the, the modern context. Um, but in terms of what I think about him generally, um, he worries me a fair bit, um, just in the sense that a lot of the kind of um, populist -y kind of uh, people who have won office in recent years uh, um, have often ended up doing, I think, more harm to their countries than good very often. Um, if you count Boris Johnson as a similar figure in that way, he's winning more on charisma um, than he is particularly on policy. Um, what we're seeing at the moment coming out in the various inquiries into the handling around COVID is, was a very unprofessional handling of the government um, who actually had sort of mishandled things and damaged um, governmental operations at times and so on. And he couldn't understand a lot of the issues being put before him. Um, and I think that's very true with a lot of the other kind of populist kind of figures. Uh, and some, and Malay, unfortunately, has that kind of tinge to him, in my mind. There's a kind of, um, there's a kind of winning on personality. So the whole thing of him holding up the chainsaw, right? There's that, there's that kind of popularity about that. And um, I'm, that worries me a little bit. And part of why it worries me is because he's seen as a representative of kind of free market economics and all this kind of stuff is that if he really doesn't do very well, it'll damage that cause very much, so, which is what we saw with Liz, Liz Truss, right? Um, basically in the UK, the cause of free markets is damaged probably for the next few decades, because <clears throat> if you ever try, try to advocate it, people will say, oh, look what Liz Truss went and did, right? So in that sense, and um, the kind of the influence from Ayn Rand is kind of exciting to see. Like I'm, I'm always kind of very pleased when you see political figures quoting Ayn Rand, but unfortunately all of them don't that I've ever seen don't have a tremendously good understanding of her. And that was pointed out by the Ayn Rand Institute in his quoting of her, the ethics of emergencies in completely the wrong way. Like you, you wonder whether he really even read that essay. Um, so, I mean, I just, you know, with the show's drawing to a close sort of shortly, but I just wondered, do you guys, do you share that kind of worry about the unprofessionalism of it? Because what, what I would love to see really is a political figure who supports free markets and who has this kind of charisma, but also who kind of has that professionalism about them that who kind of inspires the confidence they would have command of the issues, the command of policy, and could also run the government properly. Um, so, I mean, we'll just, let's go around again. Alejandro, do you, do you agree with me on that or do you think differently? I, I, I think, sorry, Morgan, I think I lost you for a second. Can you repeat the question? So do you share my in a sense, worries about Millet? Because one of the things that I think people people really are infused about these populistic kind of guys, but um, there's a kind of unprofessionalism about them that kind of worries me. And I see that in Millet as well. So what I'd really love to see is a combo of someone who had kind of a professional attitude, who could kind of inspire confidence that he could do this job well, but was also a free market here. 
um, rather than having this kind of trade-off where we've got a kind of charisma politician who's uh, who's in favor of this stuff. Um, do, you, do you share my worry or do you feel differently about it? Yes, I, I do think that one of the things that I've noticed in him is that he has some um, desire to have... It's really weird to, to say this because I think in a, in a sense he in an ideological sense he doesn't want it but maybe on a more psychological level he would in the sense that he 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 wants to have a certain kind of powers um and, and use them and and he wants to 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 take them so i i wouldn't say that he's a power luster because he's very he's been very uh, eager to say that he wants to delegate the power, and he he has been quoting the idea of, I didn't come here to to carry out lambs. I came out to to release lions, which means basically I want I want you to keep back your freedom to you. At the same time, he sometimes has this. Uh, <laughs> sometimes he has this central pl uh, planner mentality in. Um, Although it's very difficult to grasp or, or to or to even conclude that he has that psychology, but I, I certainly agree with you that uh, he's he seems a bit volatile sometimes. Yeah, um, well, I'll go around for the final comments, but quickly I'll read out the super chats just because I think we're almost going to run out of time. So we've got four ninety nine from Jonathan. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Frank Grail, two dollars. Who said Galloway called Christopher Hitchens a Trotsky is Pop and Jay. Uh, he did that. There was a there's an interesting debate between Hitchens and Galloway from like 2004, something about the Iraq War, which is which is worth watching. Um, Three dollars from John Was. Thank you so much, John. Um, Robert, do you do you also share this kind of concern, or do you feel differently? Oh, I do not share the concern, or rather, I do share the concern. I do see that uh, Malay could crash and burn. He could be all bravado, all personality, all television show host he could be an entire a complete donald trump i still think that on balance it's going to be a good development for argentina given the context of south america given what the alternatives are down there given the situation they're in and the steps he's already going to take he's going to improve things and people may say yeah but these other bad things happened and therefore capitalism gets a black eye they're not going to be able to pull it off not in this case so the result's going to be somewhere between better than we could have expected and really, really good. And I think that's the range of possibilities. So I do share your concerns. I just think even the worst case is going to be pretty damn good. Then Mark and Richard, you've got probably a minute each. What do you guys think? Uh, I think it's unfair to, to, to compare it to Boris Johnson. Boris Johnson never had a principle or an idea in his life, probably. Um, Emile, I've heard him talk about money creation in the Cantillon effect. I've heard him talk about social justice. So at least he knows what he's He's a bit more like the CEO Ryan uh, Michael O'Leary. He's good at doing this kind of stance to, to grab attention. Okay. Um, I will compare him to Boris Johnson for a second, just to create a ruckus back home. <laughs> Uh, just because uh, I think he d coming from the uh, the popular TV side of things and in an age where we're looking for where politicians do have to have sort of TikTok level gimmicky reach in order to cut through with a chunk of the electorate, not our chunk, but a chunk of the electorate. And given he's going against the political mainstream, can he also go totally against the culture as well by being staid and boring? Probably not. So if the gimmicky side of it helps the rest get swept along with it then uh, i'll take that even if it's uh involves uh, a few shallow stunts along the way all right very good well uh we're gonna have to sign off thank you everyone for watching at seven o'clock so in 60 seconds we've got the thousand head book club for aoc uk members uh please everyone head over to there or sign up to be an aoc uk member if you're not um thank you so much for joining me guys and we'll see everyone tomorrow on the reality show thank you so much Recording stopped.